Tonight we're in Ephesians. We are in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21, as the title suggests. And tonight uh, we are really kind of focusing on more of a Bible study of Ephesians 5 this evening. And I want to point out some important exegetical keys in understanding the passage before us. Um, it is really helpful. We're going through Ephesians rather slowly, uh, rather quickly for the way I usually do things. But uh, slowly, as you think about this being a letter, and it is best read in one sitting and see the whole uh, as rather than just the part. You know, you don't usually pick up a letter and read a paragraph and put it down and then pick up next week a paragraph and put it down and so on and so forth, but you read a letter from start to finish and certainly any book of the Bible becomes much more understandable when you read it that way. And I would encourage you to try to do that every once in a while with virtually all the books of the Bible. Now, some of them are quite the challenge, such as Isaiah, for example, or Psalms. And uh, can't do it for all, but these small books, uh, I'd really encourage you to, to think about reading the whole book in, in one sitting. And as we approach the book of Ephesians, the emphasis of the section that we have uh, been in the believer's walk, that is the way that we live our lives in everyday actions and activities. And the key word is walk. And it's used five times in this particular section of Ephesians. We also find it earlier in Ephesians that I will mention much later at the end of the message. But in this particular section that we're in, uh, I want to draw your attention to the connections. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, there is this statement, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That is a theme statement for the entire section of which we are in uh, up to chapter 5, verse uh, 21. So the main idea is walking in a manner worthy of our calling. Then verse 17 states, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Then verses 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. And we were in that section uh, last week. And Ephesians 5, 7 and 8, Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And then verse 15 of chapter 5, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Further, we can understand how these exhortations relate to each other. For, as I said, we have Ephesians 4.1 as the overarching theme. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to what you have been called. Then we have explanatory exhortations, meaning this is an ex explanation of what it means to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. What does that mean? Well, verse 17, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So there needs to be a complete change in our behavior and conduct, no longer walking as a unbeliever, but walking as a believer in the manner of which we are called. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, therefore being imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. So that's the positive statement of what it means to walk in a manner worthy of his calling. And then in verse 8, walk as children of light. 
And then we have the concluding exhortation. So we have the bookends. Ephesians 4.1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And then <clears throat> Ephesians 5.15, look carefully then how you walk. Uh, so that is the concluding exhortation. Be careful. Be careful in the way that you walk. Reason, uh, verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, I'm not going to go into those evil days very much, but I'm going to be focusing on the walk tonight. And then there are these concluding exhortations that are associated with walking carefully. Ephesians 5, 17, and 18. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And then the concluding ex explanation and exhortation. Ephesians 5, 19, 20, and 21, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in the heart, uh, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the theme tonight is the believer is to walk carefully in a sin-ridden world. We need to walk carefully in a sin-ridden world. Look carefully then how you walk. So number one, then we're given three contrasts. We are told how not to walk, followed by how we should walk. First, we are not to walk like the unwise, but rather we're to walk like the wise. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. The second contrast, we are given a second contrast to help us better understand the contrast between the wise and the unwise. What does that mean? That we do not walk like the unwise, but we walk like the wise. Verse 17 tells us, therefore, you see that concluding word, therefore, do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So the foolish, who are the unwise of verse 15, are those that are ignorant of God's will. The wise are those who understand and do God's will. Verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And the understanding isn't just intellectual comprehension, but an understanding in the sense that, that you get it and you apply it. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. So the word of God is given to us so that we would obey it. It's not just given to help us win Bible trivia or just to puff us up in our knowledge, but it's to reveal what God's will is. So that's why it tells us not to be ignorant, but understand what God's will is. Understand in everyday life what it is that God wants you to do and what God doesn't want you to do. Understand the parameters. Understand as you make decisions. Understand as you enter into relationships. Understand as you do your business. Understand as you interact with other people. Understand as you're being instructed and taught. Know what God's will is. Know what God has said, what God has declared, what God has revealed as to how we are to live and how we are not to live. Then we're given a third contrast to better understand how we are to be better able to walk in the will of the Lord. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And that's going to be the focus tonight. I, I want to look at that rather strange analogy of not being drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is drunkenness made an analogy to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. What are we to learn from that analogy? So 
Number two, it is the third contrast we're going to focus upon this evening. Why is being filled with the Spirit contrasted to being drunk with wine? Well, first, the analogy explained. The analogy explained. Being drunk with wine, in the analogy, is contrasted to being filled with the Spirit. So what is meant by being drunk, in some sense, equates being filled with the Spirit, and so we have to ask the question, of what in what sense? What does drunkenness have to do with being filled? Well, to be drunk helps us understand what it means to be filled. First, a person who is drunk does not have a, a blood alcohol level of 100%. So when you're talking about somebody who's drunk, it isn't somebody who's just swimming in alcohol. Rather, he or she is controlled by the alcohol. That is, they are under the influence. Uh, we talk about DUIs, driving under the influence. They are affected by the alcohol. The alcohol affects one's speech, one's actions, one's inhibitions. One's entire being is influenced or affected. A person under the influence acts differently when they are drunk from when they are sober. The point of the analogy is so too a person who is filled with the Spirit does not have the Spirit from one's foot to the top of one's head. We're not talking about a spatial filling. But rather the person who is filled with the Spirit is under the control or influence of the Holy Spirit. Thus, the believer's speech, inhibitions, and actions are all influenced as a result of being filled with the Spirit. That's the point of the analogy. Just as the alcohol affects the entire being, and we are different people as a result of the alcohol, so too the Holy Spirit affects our entire being, and we are different people because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the effects of being drunk and the effects of being filled are what is contrasted in the analogy. For being drunk results in debauchery. For it says in verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. The word debauchery literally means behavior which shows lack of concern or thought for the consequences of an action. Senseless, deedless, reckless deeds, recklessness. And that comes from uh, the uh, Greek lexicon Lu, uh, Luan uh, Nida. The drunk becomes slurred in speech their cognitive and physical act abilities are impaired, and their inhibitions are removed so that they become either what is known as a happy drunk or a mean drunk. Some people, when they get drunk, you know, they're, they're putting the lampshade on the, the head and dancing on the table, doing things that they wouldn't do when they were sober. Other people, when they get drunk, get mean, and they get angry, and they get boisterous, they get loud, they get argumentative, and they want to fight. Well, they take on characteristics that they don't normally possess except when they're controlled by the alcohol. The text does not go in detail concerning the negative behavior of the drunk, but that's not the point, but rather goes into detail regarding the positive behavior of one who is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, all it says is, the person who is drunk with wine, well, that results in debauchery. Then you have to unpack that and think that through. What does that mean? Because it's not really interested in telling us all about the negative aspects of being drunk and all the characteristics of one uh, that is drunk. But rather, it wants to tell us about the effects of being filled with the Spirit. What effect does being filled with the Spirit have upon us? How does it change our behavior? How does it change our conduct? 
How are we different people when we are filled with the Spirit as opposed to when we are not filled with the Spirit? That's where this is heading. The positive influence or enablement of the Holy Spirit is given in verses 19 and 21. That's why I say it's explanatory. It's telling us these are the characteristics of a person who is filled with the Spirit, who is controlled by the Holy Spirit, who has become a, a different individual from what they were because of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So that, number one, the person who is under the influence, and I realize the Holy Spirit is a person, but we're following through on this analogy, the person who is under the influence, under the control of the Holy Spirit, is singing when in other occasions they would not be singing. So Ephesians 5.19 says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sometimes drunk people sing too. Uh, there are bar songs that are, are sung because they become happy. But here it results in a singing that brings honor and glory to God. It, it results in singing hymns and, and praise. We'll unpack that in a moment. We're just taking a big view first. Number two, the person who is under the influence is giving thanks when otherwise they would not be giving thanks. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a thankfulness that is unique to a person who is controlled by the Holy Spirit, producing a thankfulness that doesn't naturally occur within our own hearts. But when the Spirit of God is at work, it causes us to be thankful. And then thirdly, the person who is under the influence is submitting to another, when otherwise we'd be resisting, fighting, and rebelling. Verse 21, submitting to one another. And so you have all of these phrases that help us understand what it means to be controlled or filled by the Holy Spirit. So now we're going to look at some lengthy passages that just uh, illustrate for us what this passage is teaching. We can find examples in the scripture of people's behaviors that manifest themselves as a result of the Spirit's work in their hearts and lives. So, let's begin with, let us consider an example of singing hymns to the Lord instead of grumbling and complaining. How unique it is. Starting in Acts 16, 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's not the natural response to have been unjustly beaten, to be thrown into prison, to be have one's rights 
violated. It's not the natural response to sing hymns of praise and glory to God. The natural response is to grumble and complain and and to raise your fist and talk about how unjust people are and how miserable it is to be in prison in these shackles. They're cold and and what's going to happen to us tomorrow? What's going to come of this? And to worry and and to doubt and, and to be concerned. Those are the natural responses. But by the Spirit of God and by the grace of God, that's not their response. Because by God's grace, they understand the will and purpose of God. By God's grace, they understand his power. By God's grace, they understand that God is in control of this situation. By God's grace, they understand that there is more going on here than just crowds and magistrates. But God has a purpose and a will in these things. And so they sing praises to God when otherwise they would not. Let's consider the example of a thankful heart in the midst of suffering. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second characteristic of being filled with the Spirit. Acts 5, verse 40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. When they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. But they rejoiced. Rejoiced that they were beaten. Rejoiced that they were charged not to speak any longer in Jesus' name. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. Do you see the connection with our passage? That we might walk in a manner worthy of our calling? That same word is now used in the very lips of the apostles that they are thankful that they have been counted worthy to suffer. They are thankful that they have been so associated with Christ that they're being persecuted. They are thankful that that they're identifying with Christ so that when people think of them, they view them as Christians. And the opposition to Christ is the very same opposition that they're facing because they're identified with him. And that's what they're rejoicing in, that they belong to Christ. And they are so closely connected to him that they partake in the very same sufferings that Jesus partook in. As Jesus was being treated, they were being treated. Thankful. Thankful for the work that God had done in their hearts to bring them into that kind of relationship to Jesus Christ, to have overcome their inhibitions, their reluctance to serve Christ. And so they're rejoicing. They're giving thanks. Next, let us consider an example of losing one's inhibitions as a result of being filled with the Spirit. Acts 4, 23 to 31. When they were released, this is the apostles again, again after having been imprisoned. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? That's Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. 
I, I can't just skip over that. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Doesn't that sound like this morning's message? Doesn't that sound like 1 Kings 12? And I can tell you, passage after passage after passage, that sounds like. Including Romans 8, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To become <coughs> to be conformed to his image. They understood. They understood that they were not just suffering at the hands of men. They understood that God was behind this. That's the cause of rejoicing. That's the cause of giving thanks. That's what emboldens them. Not that God is indifferent or that God can't oversee or God can't deliver or God can't help. Quite the contrary. They understand that God is behind this. But he has a purpose in this. Verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. See, the inhibition is removed. The reluctance that would naturally occur as a result of being persecuted, as a result of being threatened, of saying, if you continue to speak in the name of Christ, Worse things are going to happen to you. So they pray. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and the result is their inhibitions are removed. And now they speak boldly. They're boisterous. They are acting out as a result of what the Spirit has done in their hearts and lives. What we're to learn is that the apostles were not super people. They weren't super Christians. But the apostles were relying on the Holy Spirit to overcome their weaknesses, to overcome their, their natural reluctance, their fears, their, their inhibitions. And so rather than to try to stir ourselves up to be these better Christians, you know, we sometimes browbeat ourselves into saying, you know, why don't I speak up more? Why don't I act more like a believer? Why am I afraid? Why am I intimidated? Why do I give in to peer pressure? Why, 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 why? And we can get to play so guilty. Well, the Word of God says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit take control of our hearts and lives so that we're different people than what we are in our own strength, in our own nature, in our own being. So the analogy applied. That's also very good. But how does one achieve being filled with the Spirit. Well, what does that really look like? Well, first, being drunk is a choice. Being drunk is a choice. You choose to be drunk. You choose to imbibe. And you choose to continue to imbibe to the place where you start losing control and you finally are intoxicated. It's a choice. So too, being filled with the Holy Spirit is a choice. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit is an imperative. It's a command. 
It's something that the Word of God tells us to do. The onus is on us. Do not be drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's our responsibility to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not a once-for-all-time event, just like being drunk is not a once-for-all-time event. You don't get drunk in one day, and now you're drunk for the rest of your life, and you're not filled with the Spirit one day, and now you're filled with the Holy Spirit for the rest of your life. It's to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, and there are times in which we are under control, and there are times that we're not. So we are to be people who regularly, repeatedly, try to, with greater consistency, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number three, we are to submit to and seek the Spirit's work in our life as opposed to resisting and quenching the Holy Spirit's work. So let's go back and review a passage. We're trying to tie these things together that we've looked at in parts, but now trying to see the, the whole picture. Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say and testify to the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous. They have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the first step is for this spiritual renewal to take place in one's mind. The way that we view life, the, the way we think about life, the way we understand the will of God. Verse 24. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness, which is unfolded to us later when it says, be imitators of God, that, that we are to be like God in showing love. Verse 25. Therefore, Having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So, we stop lying and start telling the truth. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And remember, I, I preached through all this. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talking come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. An interesting thought to give grace to those that hear. A means of grace is an important theological term. It it's talking about the way in which grace is imparted. So communion is thought of a means of grace, that God meets with us as we partake of communion. Preaching is considered a means of grace, that, that God meets with us as we preach his word, and he does a work in our hearts and lives. But our conversation can be means of grace. We can be a help to one another. We can encourage one another. We can reinforce, reinforce in each other's hearts and lives the importance of living for Christ, the benefits of living for Christ and submitting to one another, upholding one another, praying for one another. All the ways in which we enhance the, the Spirit's work in our life and when we don't do that, when we murmur, when we complain, when we backbite, when we say nasty things to each other, we're quenching the, the spirit of God's work in that person's life and in our own. We're encouraging rebellion. We're encouraging resistance. 
rather than encouraging submission and obedience. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, to whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. To grieve the Holy Spirit. To wound the Holy Spirit. To, to resist the Holy Spirit. We all know what it is to be convicted by God. We all have experienced, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have experienced in your life situations in which you have known how you should act, how you should respond. And right before you do the wrong thing, it pops into your mind and you know it's the wrong thing to do, but you do it anyway. It's the grace of God that it pops into your mind that you shouldn't do it. Or, conversely, it pops into your mind you should do it. You're, you're prompted to talk to someone. You're, you're prompted to to give, you're, you're, you're prompted to help, but you resist because you really don't want to. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. That's quenching the Holy Spirit. That's keeping the Holy Spirit from working in your life, of producing within you, not allowing him to have the control over your life that, that he desires. So it's a matter of yielding when prompted. Yielding when convicted, when you leave a message and it seems to hit you right between the eyes and you really know what God wants you to do, but by midweek it, it wears off and you don't have that same desire that you had in the service. And we can quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. So we're to pray that we are filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3.14. Notice how this is all tying together. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. This is the forerunner. This is what we're talking about, about being filled with the Holy Spirit, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Same terminology. That you would be controlled by the Spirit of God. That you would be acting like God acts. So every time we are unloving, we are quenching the Spirit of God. Every time that we are unwilling to forgive, that's why the passage two before this says we are to be tenderhearted, kind, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Every time we refuse to forgive, we are quenching the Spirit. We're going against the will of God. We're saying, no, I don't want to forgive. I want to hold my anger. I want to get even. And when we do, we just walk like the world. We just buy into everything they're selling. And when it says that we need to understand that days are evil. It means we're surrounded by ungodliness everywhere we turn. Every influence other than the Christian faith is encouraging us to act contrary to the Word of God. Eric Jr. has been doing the Beatitudes, and one of the things that he keeps saying is they're countercultural which is absolutely true. They run contrary to what the world would teach us how to live. 
And that's why we have to walk so carefully because we are constantly beating our heads against everything that the world tells us. We're, we're swimming upstream. We come and we hear something in church and we don't hear it anywhere else. Our neighbors aren't telling us that. The news commentators aren't telling us that. The talk shows aren't telling us that. The tabloids aren't telling us that. Nobody else is telling us those things. And that's why it's so important when we gather together that we're building each other up, that together we are reinforcing for one another what's the right thing to do. We're not just relying upon what a Sunday school teacher says or what comes from this pulpit, but we're interacting constantly encouraging one another that as you stand, as, as you make decisions that are for the glory of Christ, those are the right decisions. Those are the good things. So in conclusion, let me just again walk you through. And I've added two verses from where we started. Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you've been called. Now this I say in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. That refers back to Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked before you were saved. You walked in the futility of your mind here it tells us what that means, in which you once walked, following the course of the world, living like everyone else around you. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of the disobedience. So the opposite of the Holy Spirit being worked at work in the life of the believer, the evil one is at work in the life of the unbeliever, causing the unbeliever to do things that are atrocious, where the Holy Spirit is prompting to do us things that are godly and holy. Ephesians 5.1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We talked about that last Sunday night. Exposing, showing how one is to live. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. May God help us. May God help us. So my closing word of encouragement to you is pray. Pray. Don't just resolve. Don't just try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But pray that God would change us. That God would make us different people by his grace, by his spirit. Pray that we'd be less resistant to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. That when we're convicted, we will confess, we will repent, we will seek to depart from we won't just resist and refuse to repent and refuse to conduct ourselves the way that we should not go. Don't harbor bitterness. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't hold grudges. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. May God help us. May we walk by the power of his spirit. 
may we come to a place where we really recognize our weakness. We just can't do this. Only God can enable us. Only God can change us. Only God can make us a different person. Can the leper change its spots? No. But God can. But God can. Our Father, help us. Help us not to grieve or quench your spirit. Thank you that you have given us your spirit. Thank you that you do bring conviction. Thank you that you do show us right from wrong. Lord, thank you that you do bring us up short time and time again. And there are times, Lord, that we really weep. There there are times in which we are struck by our sinfulness and by our obstinacy. There are times that we're just overwhelmed by your goodness and your love towards us. And we're thankful for your patience and your enduring care. Oh, Lord, may those times be far less in between. But rather they be more frequent. More and more, Lord, help us to understand. Help us to believe in your sovereignty. Help us to believe in your care. Help us to believe in your word. Help us to believe in your empowerment, your enablement. Help us to believe that you watch over us, you protect us. May we not fear man, but may we fear God. Even as you have told us, don't fear men who but can kill the body, but fear God who can throw the body into hell. Lord, thank you that, that we do not have to fear hell. Thank you that we are no longer the children of wrath. But Lord, we want to be more and more the children of heaven. We want to be more and more imitators of the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Give us a desire to pray for one another. To remember one another. To encourage one another. To help one another. To be instruments of grace. In the kindness that we show. In the words of encouragement that we give. In the way in which we hold one another up. Showing gratitude and appreciation for the sacrifices that are made when the world is full of ingratitude and takes people for advantage and uses people. Lord, help us to be so, so different. Guard our hearts and minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.